Welcome. You are listening to the Fat and Furious podcast. In this podcast series, your host, Steve Bennett, father of seven, best-selling author and adventurer, will be joined by 23 of the world's most forward-thinking medical professionals. Doctors, authors, and top nutritionists, where he'll share the truth behind living healthier and happier for longer. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to Patrick Holden. After studying biodynamic agriculture at Emerson College, Patrick established a mixed community farm in Wales in 1973, which today is the longest running organic farm in the country. Patrick was the founding chairman of the British Organic Farmers in 1982, later joining the Soil Association, where he worked for nearly 20 years as a director, and during which time the organisation led the development of organic standards across the country. Patrick is the founding director of the Sustainable Food Trust, working internationally to accelerate the transition towards a more sustainable food system. He's patron of the UK Biodynamic Association and was awarded the CBE for his services to organic farming in 2005. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us. Um, for everybody that's uh, watching us on Sky or watching the, the podcast or, or the, the webcast, um, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction to why I've asked Patrick to join us, and then we'll jump straight in. Uh, and, and the reason is this. I heard you speak at um, the, the Royal Institute for General Practitioners with the PHC conference, gave a great lecture about meat and farming and sustainable farming and sustainable diets. Uh, and then... I turn on the Chris Evans show a few weeks later, and you, you, you're on Chris Evans the same time as Primal Screen, which was fantastic. And Chris Evans like kept you on for the, like the whole hour, which is unusual for Chris Evans, uh, talking about sustainability and so on and so forth. And I was really like, oh, we're getting there. You know, we, we're getting there as a nation. We start to understand it. And then four weeks later, BBC headline news: cows are killing the planet. We shouldn't eat meat. It's dangerous for us. And it's like back to square one. And 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 like all the all the recommendations, what we should eat, shouldn't eat, what's sustainable, what isn't, seems to go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And I thought, right, I'm going to get you onto the show with us because I really trust your opinion. Um, and thank you for coming. So just for everybody, to, so you, you ran, you were a director of the Soil Association for 15 years. Tell us a little bit about that. And then you went on to found the Sustainable Food Trust. Tell me a bit more about that too, please. Well, yes, thank you and, very and much for having me on. And I've just talked for ages. So... You know, take over central stage. Let's have your history, where you started off, maybe then coming up to the Sword Association. Well, probably a little bit of history. I, I am a Londoner, actually. Grew up in London. My dad was a doctor. And when I was, well, in my teens, really, we had some childhood holidays in wild places, and I fell in love with nature. Used to keep a lot of pets in our London gardens. So I had somewhere in my DNA yeah. an interest in farming, and this was awakened. And then I went to California in the beginning of the 70s, and that was a very interesting time to be around green thinking. I decided to get back to the land, and a group of six of us moved to West Wales in 1973 and set up a sort of community farm, mm -hmm. which didn't last that long, um, but it was a great experience. Uh, but I stayed, and uh, now, 46 years later, I'm still farming the same bit of land, Fantastic. and it's now the longest established organic dairy farm in Wales. Okay. And we're producing cheese from the milk of our Ayrshire cows. And we used to grow vegetables. I'd like to talk about that as well mm -hmm. at some point. Uh, but along the road, of course, it, as well as being a practicing farmer, I've also had a day job of talking about it. Okay. And I was involved with the Soil Association, as you said, for about 20 years, director for 15. But then in 2010, I decided that it was important to get these messages about what should I eat to be healthy and sustainable, mm -hmm. which is what really interests me, out to a wider audience. So I set up a new organization, the Sustainable Food Trust, and our mission is to accelerate the transition towards more sustainable food systems, which we think is really important at the moment because mm -hmm. with climate change and all the biodiversity things and the public health issues, we need to change. So we, by eating differently and linking our diets to the output of sustainable farming, we can be part of the solution. And that's what I talked to Chris Evans about. I mean, just brilliant. I mean, 46 years experience 
around organic farming and, and lots of experience around the Soil Association. They've been to lots of conferences and seen loads of graphs and charts and all the things that, that give us sort of evidence-based. Um, so you're, you're the right person to be talking to on this subject. And, and, and I only found out today when we had a brief chat before we started, I've got seven children, but you, you trump me with eight. <laughs> no, it's not, a, not a, a th something to be perhaps too proud about, well, given the population challenges of yes. the planet at the moment. But I, I, sorry I, about the, the <laughs> impact, but no, I'm not sorry that I brought my children into the world. You know what, I say exactly the same thing. I've got seven, so I need to make sure they all turn out to be great contributors to the planet. Uh, but what I think that does give us, it gives us a real sense of knowing that we're going to have probably lots of grandchildren, making sure moving forward, what we eat is not only good for our health, but also good for the planet. And, uh, and therefore, uh, when you told me you've got eight children, I thought, right, now I understand why you're so passionate about sustainable food, sustainable diets. So give us some fundamentals then, uh, what you've learned about what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat. And then let's later on come on to how on earth the BBC came up with that headline. So well, give us some real basics as if we know nothing about, pretend we know nothing about global warming or farming, because certainly I know nothing about farming other than my little uh, patch in my garden. But uh, so, so give us some real fundamentals about farming leading through to what we should be eating and also how that affects the planet. Well, just to pick up on your experience in your own garden, I think that we can learn and know a great deal about what sustainable food production should look like mm -hmm. from our own direct experience because at a cellular level yep. a window box or a garden or an allotment yes. can be replicated on a wider level mm -hmm. on a farm and that's what I've been doing I've just been applying similar principles just on a bigger a bigger stage a bigger canvas yeah. um, everybody as I mentioned is asking this question well what should I eat mm -hmm. to be sustainable and healthy and I think there's a lot of very confusing messages out there very few of them are coming from practicing farmers. Sure. So I guess what I bring is a lot of experience of trying to farm in a green and environmentally friendly way because that's what took me back to the land in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I can see that the system of farming that we've been using works, which is very confidence building because sure. for those 46 years, we've never used any chemical fertilizers or pesticides. We've tried to farm with the grain of nature in harmony with nature rather than trying to suppress nature with various poisons and artificial growth stimulants, that sort of thing. And as a result, we've produced, we've developed a system which is producing very uh, healthy and nutritious food in a way which coexists with the environment yep. and the biodiversity and the natural capital of our hill. Now, I don't know if you know about. Um, Dame Ellen MacArthur, you know, the woman who sailed sure, around the world, yeah, yeah. she set up this project called the Circular Economy. Okay. And she was inspired when she went to the Antarctic by realizing that she saw the plastic there and she realized that everything is circular and everything is finite. Yeah. And in a way, we're applying those principles on our farm in West Wales. We're thinking, how can we look after the capital, the biodiversity, the plants, the insects, the birds, everything, but at the same time, produce as much food as we can without bringing in non-renewable pesticides, mm -hmm. feeds, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our experience from that is that you can produce really excellent nutritious crops of vegetables, of grains, and yes, of livestock products mm -hmm. working in that way. But of course, while we've been doing that, a lot of farmers, for no fault of their own, have been going in a very different direction. They've been encouraged by guaranteed prices and the, sure. the availability of cheap pesticides and chemical fertilizers yep. to go for the sort of maximum production approach. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, those methods of farming have depleted the soil fertility. They've killed off a lot of the wildlife and they reduced farmers to the role of being commodity slaves, sure. producing meats which are not healthy mm -hmm. and are certainly not good for the planet. Mm -hmm. So what we have been looking at with all this debate about, you know, the Eat Lancet report and the yeah. climate change debate and the BBC and everything else, we're thinking, hang on a minute. We need, if we're asking the question, which sort of food should we eat to be healthy and sustainable? Yep. This whole plant-based thing has gone full strength over the last five or 10 years, mm -hmm. and now there's a whole generation of young people who, want, who think it's the right thing to do is become 
vegan, if not vegan vegetarian, when in fact you cannot produce healthy vegetables without build it, first building soil fertility with a crop rotation, which involves clover and grass. Yes. And the only way to cl turn that clover and grass into something that we can eat is to graze it with cattle or sheep, ruminants, that means they have a stomach which can digest mm -hmm. the cellulose material in the grass and clover. And if we don't support those farmers by buying the livestock products from that system, yes. they can't make it work. Okay. So there are thousands of livestock farmers in the west of Britain right now thinking, what do we do? The price of beef and lamb is crashing. Mm -hmm. Beef consumption's halved since the 1980s in the United Kingdom. Wow. And lamb consumption, no young people are eating lamb. They think because George Monbiot and people like that say it's bad, yeah. they're all giving it up thinking that's the right thing to do. And in fact, of all the meats we could eat, lamb is probably the healthiest and the most sustainable and the most natural grass-fed lamb. Sure. More or less all the lamb we produce in the UK is grass-fed. Mm -hmm. Even the beef in the UK, most of it's grass-fed. Now feedlot beef, which is what characterizes the American system, that is part of the problem because sure. all these grains that these beef animals are eating yeah. are grown in South America or in North America, genetically modified mm -hmm. soy and maize. And these crops are grown in an unsustainable way. So we need to become very sophisticated and educated consumers and differentiate between the livestock products which are part of the problem, yep. which is intensively produced chicken, intensively produced pork, mm -hmm. and yes, dairy products from very large, these large mega dairy herds, mm -hmm. and those which are absolutely part of the solution. And that means grass-fed lamb, as I said, grass-fed yep. beef, and in my case, a special interest here, yep. mainly grass-fed um, dairy cows producing cheese, butter, milk, and yogurt and other products. But wow, so, it, so, it, there's a lot there so to you, I was going to say you gave us a lot there, so yeah. I want to unravel one of the things you just said, because I'd never thought about this before. So we, I think we learned at school a little bit about crop rotations, but what you're saying is that unless at some point we have livestock on that land, even if we then was all to turn vegetarian, we needed that livestock to start the process of, of making the land fertile. Is that what we're saying? Yes, and all farmers did that until the Second World War when a byproduct of the explosives industry, ammonium nitrate, which was mm -hmm. used for explosives, became available for fertilizers. And after fertilizers became available, uh, before that, farmers were just using crop rotation to build fertility with uh, legumes, which are clovers and other mm -hmm. plants like that, which fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere and grass to build the fertility up in a seven or eight year cycle and then crops of grain and vegetables to uh, take it down again. After nitrogen fertilizer became available, they abandoned all that and they just grew crops year after year after year. Mm -hmm. That's what's happened ever since the Second World War. And now the fertility of our soils has reached a critically low level, which compromises the nutritional status of the vegetables and the grains and the other crops that farmers grow. So. What we need to do, this is a, a soundbite version of what I've just said, <laughs> we need to align our future diets yes. to the output of sustainable farming systems mm -hmm. in the region or country where we live. That's simple enough. Yep. So we need to say, right, what would Britain produce mm -hmm. if it was all farmed sustainably? What proportions of red meat, grass-fed, yep. uh, chicken, pastured and organic, mm -hmm. because we shouldn't eat the industrial chicken at all. It's not sure. even good for us. Yeah. No more intensive pork, because that's all f feeding on grain that is produced in environmentally disastrous ways. And then what vegetables can we grow in these crop rotations? What grains? Let's look at the proportions and then let's align our diets accordingly. And actually, we could eat very healthily if we did that. But we all need to become a little bit more expert yeah, in all these issues. So, exactly. Uh, my second edition uh, of Primacure was very much aimed at Great Britain. So let's let's just think about Great Britain then for a moment. And let's break it down then from pork, beef, chicken uh, 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 and, and lamb. Uh, and let's do one at a time then. So okay. uh, we first of all, and we will come on for everybody. Uh, I've got a real bee in my bonnet about the BBC headline. I've got a real bee in my bonnet about how it was funded and the authors of that Lancet report, which pretty much says we all need to be vegetarian and, and, and almost vegan, uh, which is just complete nonsense for health as far as I'm concerned. And I think we've just heard uh, from Patrick that we need an element of meat as long as it's done properly, uh, even to get the 
healthy, nutritious vegetables we need meat in the first place, because otherwise then we're relying on fertilizers and made well, chemicals to get good crops. We need livestock. We don't, if we've got ethical objections to eating uh, livestock products, that's, you know, I'm, Mm -hmm. Two people who work in my office are vegetarian, and yep. we have wonderful conversations about this. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have ethical objections and the animals have a good life and a good death, because we're campaigning on local yep. abattoirs as well, mm -hmm. then we can not only eat this, these grass-fed red meat products with a clear conscience, we can know that actually by doing so, we're supporting a system of farming which is truly sustainable. Yep. And on the subject of the BBC, when those headlines were playing out on the Today programme about a month ago, I've got the studio number. So I rang up and I said, hang on a minute, your headlines are inaccurate. They are not reflecting. This was the IPCC report mm -hmm. on sustainable diets. And actually what the BBC were reporting on it was not even reflecting the key conclusions of the report. And what happens is you get this sort of orthodoxy running where all the journalists say, oh, meat is bad, plant-based, plant-forward diets are the way ahead. Everybody thinks that they should go vegetarian or maybe even vegan, and there's a lot of growth in those diets yeah. now. But actually, the science doesn't support that. And mm -hmm. I'm here to just remind people that we should be led by the practicalities sure. of farming. Okay, I'm, I'm going to pick up what you said then, uh, because I wrote something very similar in both of my books, and I now realise one of them is a slight error. So I said exactly what you just said, which is, if you're doing it... Uh, on ethical grounds in terms of animals and you, you don't like the idea of eating animals, absolutely fine. And actually, with a planet with 7 billion people and growing all the time, maybe we need probably some more vegetarians, maybe. Um, so if you're doing it yeah. for, for those reasons, great, carry on doing it. But I said, if you're either doing it for the planet or health, then you're wrong on both circumstances. But I was wrong because I, on the health one, I truly believe we have to have a diet with some meat and some vegetables if it's the right meat because that's primal that's how you know we became a species but then when it comes to the planet uh and the environment and sustainability i kind of got that wrong and i because I, I came up with, i said look if cows are bad for the planet why don't they fly you know because everybody was saying like oh, flying's not so bad cows are worse than jumping on an airplane and i just went look if cows are bad for the planet then why, why don't we see them flying in the sky? They can't be that bad. And I kind of got that a little bit wrong. Well, no, having, the, having, no I'm not sure you did really. Okay. Because let's just talk, let's talk about cows because the cows they're first. at the heart yeah. of this debate. And okay. the, most of the commentators who are advocating changing our diets mm -hmm. identify cows as being at the very heart of the problem. And what we are saying is that it is true that cows emit methane. They always have and probably whatever we do, feeding them garlic and whatever, <laughs> they still will. Right. But... That methane cycle is an ancient cycle. It's been going on as long as there have been ruminants on the planet. Mm -hmm. The new methane, which is really res critically responsible for climate change, is fossil fuel burning. Yep. And if we use ruminants to build soil by grazing grassland or um, part as part of a rotation, digesting the cellulose into food that we can eat, the soil carbon gain offsets the methane emissions. So it's not that there aren't methane emissions, there are. Mm -hmm. But if the cows and the sheep are used to maintain the soil carbon bank, which is the second largest carbon bank in the world, mm -hmm. only after the oceans, right. then Even that, the trees. Yes, I mean, if you look at what's happened now to yeah. the world's ecosystems, we yeah. used to think that the, the rainforests and yeah. the, the primal wilderness was where we could hopefully you know, keep the planet healthy, but mm -hmm. now, the planet is covered with farms. Mm -hmm. So the farms are the metabolism of the planet. Mm -hmm. And if the farming's wrong, then the planet is in an unhealthy condition. That's where we are today. So if we want to address climate change and take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it back in the soil, we need to change the way we farm. And just in a basic uh, explanation, if you can, how does having cattle uh, and sheep roaming on fields help sequest carbon dioxide? The cattle and the sheep don't actually sequester the carbon dioxide. What they do is they will graze pastures and produce food from it. And when soil is covered with clover and grass, uh, the carbon uh, increases. Whereas if you plough it up to grow crops like grains or vegetables, right. which we are, we've been doing ever since we you know, went away from hunter-gathering, yeah. uh, there is a release of carbon. 
Now, until the Second World War, as I said, there was a cycle of farming where you had a rotation with three or four years of clover and grass to build up the soil carbon and the mm -hmm. fertility, and then a depleting phase where you grew grains or vegetables. And then that cycle just carried on. Yes. Since we've had these chemicals, we've abandoned that. We've grown grains or vegetables every year. And that is what's caused the soil carbon bank to diminish. So if we took all the arable farming in the world, that's the grains and the vegetable production areas, which is all over the world, of course, mm -hmm. and we put all that land into a rotation with a fertility building phase, probably of clover of grass, then we could, it's been estimated, we could actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere and sequester it back into the soil. Yeah. The extent to which we can do that is still debated, but there's no doubt that could happen. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, if you look at the United Kingdom, we're two thirds grassland. Sure. So if we stop producing, live, have livestock eating that grass, mm -hmm. uh, we could just reforest it, of course, but that's mm -hmm. a huge amount of food that we won't have to eat here. Mm -hmm. And surely what we should do is to try to be as self-sufficient as possible in our diets. So that's my message. Align your future diets to the productive capacity of the place where you live. So we need to understand what that means in terms of output from farming. Yep. Yes, we can eat delicious vegetables. And if we want to be vegetarian and vegan, we can eat those. But even those vegetables will probably be part of a system which could involve livestock. And for the most productive system, probably will involve livestock. OK, so uh, hypothetically speaking, and let's hope this never happens, uh, the fact that they put the vegetarian logo even on Frosties and Kellogg's or whatever these days, as if, as if glorifying that we should all become vegetarian. It's not long before we see an apple with a vegetarian sticker on it again. You know, just nonsense. Brainwashed thing. Vegetarian. Vegan, do you mean vegan? Vegan and, yeah. and, 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 and so on and so forth. But the question here is, just say everybody in Great Britain became vegan. Then, let's assume nothing comes across our channel. Then we took those two thirds of uh, grasslands and converted them all to, to corn or, and f or, or whatever. Oh yes, well some uh, could go into corn yeah. and some could go into forest. forest. So. Um, what, I think what I'm trying to get at, if there was no meat at all consumed in Great Britain, there was no cows roaming the fields and, 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 and no sheep in the fields, and we all went vegetarian, it all became corn, we ploughed all the lands up, oh, we'd probably do more harm to greenhouse gases and the environment than if we carry on you know, eating real meat and real lamb? I think we could, we should increase the proportion of plant-based materials in our diets, whether it's vegetables or grains or other plant products, mm -hmm. and we should decrease the overall consumption of meat. But the meat we should stop eating is the industrial chicken and the pork and the intensive dairy farming products. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you just look at the grass-fed lamb, beef, and mainly grass-fed dairy products, we should probably increase the relative proportions of those meats in our diet. Mm -hmm. Now, if we did, as you said, and we applied a sort of vegetarian stroke vegan approach yep. to feeding the United Kingdom in the future, yes, we could reforest a lot of land. And I know George Mombe has actually suggested that my farm should be reforested because he thinks that Wales is a nation of grass, which it mainly is. And therefore, the best thing to do is to stop growing food on it because he thinks that lambs and beef are part of the problem, which I'm disputing. But even in the areas where we all think that there are good soils which can grow vegetables and grains that we can eat, for those crops to be healthy and nutritious, they need to be grown as part of a crop rotation, which, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. has a fertility building element probably of three or four years probably of grass and clover or some form of leguminous plants. Yep. And the way to turn that into food is to have animals on it. So even the vegans, if you want to have the best and mo most nutritious vegetables, uh, you probably need to be aware that there's, a, there's an animal somewhere in the background of that. Right. Now, which sort of vegetables are we eating today? If we go down to our local supermarket and we buy vegetables, say we're a vegan, mm -hmm. nearly all the vegetables that we eat are coming from uh, vegetable monocultures, mainly in, in the eastern counties, where they grow vegetables year after year or pretty intensively, at the expense of the soil fertility and, interestingly enough, at the expense of the mineral and trace element composition. Because I was going to say, if you just keep doing that time and time again, all those minerals we need, the magnesiums, the zincs and so on, they must eventually get depleted. They do. And there are studies to show that the mineral and trace element content of vegetables that we're eating today have gone down by 50% 
since the Second World War. Yeah. Now, some of that is probably to do with varieties, but a lot of it, I would suggest, is to do with farming practice. We've been mm. using these chemical fertilizers, they're stripping the soil fertility and the nutrients, and they're not part of a proper sustainable system. I used to be a, I used to be a carrot grower, and uh, for 26 years grew carrots which were sold in the supermarkets, but then they moved all their packing stations to the eastern counties. And in the end, I was having to drive my carrots 230 miles to get them to the stations that were packing for Waitrose oh. and Sainsbury's. I had to give up. Yeah. I gave up rather noisily as it <laughs> happened. I, there was an article in The Guardian and I was on the Today program because I didn't think this was a good, a good approach. This was in yeah. 2006 and I haven't grown vegetables on any scale since. So now we're only producing cheese and some meat. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I had my way, if all the Welsh citizens decided that they would eat a properly sustainable diet, then mm -hmm. they would say to people like farmers like me, will you please grow some vegetables? We'll buy them. We'll be loyal to you. And then I could introduce a vegetable element to my rotation again. I'd mm -hmm. be very happy yep. because I that's, loved growing carrots. That's getting back to buying local where you can, supporting local farmers, uh, exactly. knowing where your food comes from. And that, that, that is obviously much more sustainable. Uh, we did say we'd come back and break them down from beef to lamb to pork. Let's start then uh, with beef. Am I right in saying then if it's grass fed and the, and the cattle are out there, there is a sustainability to it. There is some benefits uh, to uh, not uh, turning that land over to, to, uh, uh, to crops. Um, but of course, if that cattle, that beef you're eating grew up in a shed, force fed, not out roaming, then that probably does have a negative on the planet, like, it does, right. on, like it does on health as well. You know, I, I, said, yes. I said in the book, all these statistics about, they keep saying uh, meat causes this type of cancer, you're 2% more likely, 3% more likely, but they, they put it all together and they don't break down what is real meat and what is meat that's been injected with antibiotics, force fed the wrong food, wrong hormones. Yeah. And... You're, bring, you're rightly bringing up a central question is that if we are buying into some of the uh, issues I've been raising, how can we as individual citizens exercise our buying power as consumers in the supermarkets and buy the products from truly sustainable systems that I've been describing? And can we know the difference by the food labeling? Yes. So say start with the beef. Yep. The answer is we can to a degree if we buy organic beef mm -hmm. or we buy beef with a pasture for life label on it. Mm -hmm. but. If we're honest, explain the difference between those two of them. Well, there's an organisation called the Pasture for Life, Pasture Fed Livestock Association. They've got a certification scheme mm -hmm. called Pasture for Life, which means that the beef or the lamb from uh, those farms is fed nothing but grass or forage in the winter. And there is a labelling scheme, but hardly any of the supermarkets are using it. Mm -hmm. You can buy some organic beef and lamb. But it's quite hard, I would say, if you go into a supermarket today looking for truly sustainable meats to be able to find a reliable uh, meat product with a good transparent story behind it so you can really feel, when I buy this, I know I'm supporting a farming system and hopefully even a farmer whose mm -hmm. identity is known to me yeah. that is part of the solution, not part of the problem. And I believe, and I hope there are some supermarkets listening to this, watching this, mm -hmm. that there are commercial opportunities because I think many millions of people would love to exercise their buying power to move us all towards a more sustainable food yes. system, but they need the supermarkets to listen to this emergent demand and developing labeling schemes which allow them to differentiate between the livestock, which is part of the problem, which is feedlot beef, mm -hmm. or pasture-fed beef, or yes. mainly pasture-fed dairy, which is part of the solution. Hard at the moment, possible, but don't forget, if you go into the, whatever it's called, a customer service desk in a supermarket and you say, I want this, I want pasture fed beef or I want organic beef, there isn't any in the, on the stall, you know, go to your local Tesco, Sainsbury's, mm -hmm. whatever. They listen because they know for every one customer who asks that question, there's probably a hundred who are thinking it. So our uh, power to influence supermarket sourcing is more than we think. Okay. So we should all go in, keep asking the same question and eventually they start to listen. I always say that, that yep. things change because the world is so commercial now. It's all about business and marketing and advertising and, uh, and so on and so forth. And I say things start to change when people change their buying habits. Completely and once right. we change our buying habits, that's the only, you can lobby, 
you can lobby uh, Nestle, you can lobby Coca Cola, you can lobby everybody. But the, as long as they, we, as long as we keep buying their product. They'll keep making loads of profit. So They'll right. keep making it. You can make it, pass as many laws. They find ways around it. The only time they really will listen is when we change our buying yeah, habits. Exactly. Because what do we spend on food? I don't know what it is. Say two thousand pounds, three thousand pounds per yeah. person per year. Obviously, it depends mm -hmm. on you know how wealthy we are and what kind of food choices we make. That you scale that up. Yeah. If a hundred people take their consuming powers, yeah. food, you know, food campaigning citizens in the supermarket. They're going to listen. Yep. So the same, what I've just said about beef applies to lamb. Yep. You know, as I said earlier, lamb is mainly grass-fed, so that's easier. Yes. So actually, if you buy lamb, you can pretty much guarantee it was mainly grass-fed. Mm -hmm. There are some things which farmers could do better. So organic farmers tend to do all the right things compared to non-organic farmers. But I think we need to sh to encourage supermarkets to really cater for this growing interest. In truly sustainably produced meat, but actually also apply the same principles to the plant-based foods that people eat. Because let's be honest, if you're a vegan and a vegetarian or a vegetarian, and you're thinking you're doing the right thing, if the mm -hmm. right thing involves palm oil, genetically modified soy, mm -hmm. oilseed rape, even dare I say avocados, most of those plant products are grown in relatively unsustainable ways, a long way from where we live. And it's an in, here's a really interesting factoid. At the beginning of the 20th century, 80% of our dietary fats in the United Kingdom came from animals, 20% from plants. Mm -hmm. Today, it's precisely the reverse. 80% yeah. from plants, 20% from animals. But most of the plant fats are those products I just yeah. mentioned. And look what's look at the story of palm oil. Yep. I mean, it's destroying the Brazilian rain. It really is, and, and people really need to take palm oil very, very seriously and, and, and look at how it's produced and where it's produced. So let me just go back to beef one more time because I want to make it crystal clear for everybody. Try and buy from your local farm where possible. Secondly, if you've got to source it from the supermarket, try and find organic grass-fed. If, if you can't find or it's out, out of budget, at least go grass-fed, but try if you can and avoid anything that hasn't got any of those labels on because it may have come a from abroad uh, and again we know certainly so the state of beef in the UK this is my research and understanding is much better than say in America yes much uh, better much much better so try and go British beef and if you've got if you're getting it from the supermarket try and get organic at least try and get grass fed but at least make sure it's British because you've got much more chance that it's, it's helping sustain uh, the, the planet. Um, but try and avoid certainly American imported unless it's got some really good uh, proof behind that it was sustainable. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of American farmers who feel exactly as, as, as I do, I think mm -hmm. as we do, and are part of the solution, but we need good labeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a wonderful scheme actually in America called Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food, right. which is sort of about yeah. provenance and about transparency. Mm -hmm. You know, the best food you can buy is from a farmer you know or is known to you. And of course, that's difficult in a world of cities where there are millions of people distant from the farms, but we can move in that direction. Absolutely. So we've, we've talked about beef, talked about lamb. Um, talk to me about pork. Well, pork's not a very good story. Okay. Uh, it used to be better than it is now because pork pigs used to be fed on swill, which may sound a bit, you know, dodgy, but mm -hmm. actually, well, Pigs are very good at recycling yeah. waste food. And yeah. we, we're all obsessed now with cutting down food waste. Well, mm -hmm. pigs were part of that solution, but because of all the BSE scandal and all the different um, food scares that we had in the 90s and the early noughties, the government moved to ban the feeding of swill uh, to pigs. And as a result now, almost all the pigs that we eat, the pork that we eat is fed on grain mostly produced in relatively unsustainable ways and mm -hmm. contributing towards greenhouse gas emissions. So I have to say it's a bit of a brutal thing to say if you're, you know, yep. if you love pork and I'm, yep. and I'm a I bacon do. lover, yep. um, we really ought to be very discerning yep. on which pork we buy. We've got three pigs on our farm at the moment. They, they love whey, by the way. Okay. So they, they have a lot of whey, which is a yep. byproduct of cheese That's making. Cheese making yeah. And if the pork we buy is organic, yep. Uh, which will be meant that at least the grains it's fed on are, are organically grown, which mm -hmm. is much more sustainable. Sure. Or they're fed on wastes which are allowable, or whey is allowable, but yep. actually there's a campaign going on at the moment to allow 
uh, swill to be fed back to pigs as mm. long as it's properly treated and it's safe, etc., etc. Yep. Then we can say, yes, we should eat pork as a treat mm. because it's pork produced in that way will probably be more expensive. And if I can just shift to chickens, yep. exactly the same thing applies. Well, I love get, chicken. Before we get to chicken, okay. so just again, because there are going to be a lot of people that like pork, they like bacon. Yep. What are we looking for on the label there to make sure that it's part of the solution, not the problem? Well, probably the only really reliable label that which will make, which will enable you to be sure that the system is pretty sustainable is the organic label. Okay. Um, you want free range, yep. but even the free range pigs may be fed on intensively produced grain. They may mm -hmm. get out, and also even free range is a movable feast. You know, sure. they might be free range for part of their lives, but yeah. not all of their lives. Yeah. So, organic is good, but again, there's opportunities here for the supermarkets to tell a better story mm -hmm. and to reach out to their customers and say, look, you want these products, we'll give them to you and we will tell you exactly the prescription that we have for the buying of truly sustainable pork. So pork is a definite, pigs are definitely part of a sustainable farming system. Mm -hmm. They can derive a third of their diet from grass, which is interesting, even though they don't have a rumen. Didn't know that. Yeah, and they love grazing pasture. Wow. So outdoor pigs, fed hopefully from home produced and sustainably produced grains yep. and waste like whey yep. and hopefully in the future like swill. Yep. Good, part of the problem. Get ready to spend a bit more. It's worth it and eat it more of a treat. Okay, fantastic, thank you for that. Right, let's talk about poultry because I think out of, uh, most of us think it's, as long as we go uh, organic, most of us think it's completely healthy, great for the planet. Uh, and certainly doesn't come on everybody's radars as much as the cow uh, in terms of the environment uh, and emissions and greenhouse and so on. Uh, and you shocked me when I heard you speak about chicken. So give us all some advice about where chicken fits in sustainable food, sustainable planet. Well, when I was a boy in the 50s and the 60s, we used to look forward to eating chicken for a Sunday roast once a month. It was pretty expensive. It was a lot more expensive than beef, uh, but we loved it. And that was because at that time, farming was still relatively sustainable and the true cost of producing chicken was more reflected in the price. Mm -hmm. Since then, we've gone into industrial grain production and that's we've also bred the chickens so that they mature and grow faster and faster sure. and mature earlier. Yeah. And as a result, the price of chicken has gone down and down and down. And we produced, actually, my organization, the Sustainable Food Trust, produced a video called A, a Tale of Two Chickens, okay. looking at the industrial chicken, mm -hmm. the grain-fed industrial chicken, never saw the light of day, in a cramped shed, going off its legs, awful stuff, antibiotics fed as a growth promoter, mm -hmm. uh, which is still actually allowed if you call it a therapy. Right. It's clever stuff, you know, okay. smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Those chickens we should not eat. So this is another tough message. Mm -hmm. Only buy chickens that come from a truly sustainable farming system. Again, that means organic is a good labeling certification scheme. Mm -hmm. Preferably those chickens should again derive a lot of their nutrition from grass. Again, about a third of their nutrition can come from grass. Mm -hmm. And the grains that they do eat or other foods will be sustainably produced, which means that the chicken that meets all those uh, buying criteria will probably be four times as expensive wow. as the three pound, don't like to mention it, yep. Tesco chicken yep. that you can buy at the moment, but it's the same yep. with all the supermarkets. Yep. That's tough, but it means that we, in a way, price rules. And the truth about the cost of the chicken, the apparently cheap chicken, is that that price ticket doesn't reflect the damage to the environment, mm -hmm. the welfare implications, or the damage to human health mm -hmm. that the production of that chicken causes, antibiotics resistance. And also, if you look at the analysis of the fats in the industrial chicken and you compare that to the pasture chicken, they're very different. So people think, erroneously in my view, that if you've got to eat meat, if you want to eat meat, then the least worst meat to eat is chicken. Mm -hmm. So if you look at sales of meat in the UK, yeah. Beef consumption has halved since the 1980s. Lamb consumption is declining precipitously. Chicken production is going up. And that's because we think that chicken is part of the solution when in fact it's part of the problem unless it's truly sustainably produced. So again, opportunities for the supermarkets here. It's weird to go into a supermarket and see a chicken which is a decent proper chicken four times the price 
of a cheap chicken, but that's what we're going to have to face. You're going to have to pay more for chicken. I guess, really, if there's a great book by a guy called Tom Phillips called Humans, uh, I'll take the swear word out, how we screwed it all up, basically. Uh, and, and actually, when you stand back from this a little bit, stand back for that market, that supermarket shelf and look at all the different chickens, the fact that one is four times more than, and there's only a couple of them on the shelf, than all those hundreds of others that are so, so cheap, must really, should, should really send off alarm bells in our heads of how on earth can you make it that cheap if real chicken costs that much. And, and, and I've never really stopped and thought about that before, and I always try and go organic where I can. Um, but the reality is it must be harming both ourselves and the planet when we're looking at all those chickens that have just been crammed into shed, uh, fed, again, glossed up, glossed over antibiotics, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. I suppose it's common sense, really, but we just try and, maybe we just try and ignore it, ignore it, maybe, I don't know. Well, you're right, it should be common sense, but of course price does rule. Yeah. You know, we, we do shop on price, that's the truth. But the real situation is that the price of the apparent cheap chicken is dishonest, and that's because of the absence of the application of the polluter pays principle. Right. So that means that if you cause damage, you should pay for it. Sure. And farmers have been following the money, we all have to follow the money, well yeah. I've got a day job so I haven't followed the money in my farming quite as much as otherwise would have been the case. Yes. But for normal farmers who haven't got a day job, yes. they look at the best margin, that's producing cheap chicken. And I'll tell you yeah. something very ironic, in Wales at the moment, uh, there are, are floods of farmers putting up chicken sheds on beef and sheep farms because the market for beef and sheep in Wales is so catastrophic at the moment mm -hmm. that there's no money to be made, whereas still money to be made in industrial chicken production. So builders who have uh, got order books full mm -hmm. and planners are full of applications for these industrial chicken sheds. What a sad thing is that, that our buying trends have made it impossible for Welsh and actually all the livestock mm -hmm. farmers of, of Western Britain to keep in business. So they're going into chickens, but chickens which are causing damage to the planet. So what we really need to do to address this, and we've been talking to DEFRA and to the Welsh Assembly government about this, is we need to apply the polluter pays principle mm -hmm. to the damaging practices and inputs which mm -hmm. are causing climate change, which are causing destruction of soil, yes. and which are compromising the health and welfare of animals. And if we did that, then the difference between the, the cheap up. chicken and the yes. expensive chicken will come down mm -hmm. and we all want to do the right thing yeah. and most of us would prefer to buy a sustainable chicken if we look at the price and it's four times as much we're going to think oh i don't know if i'm going to do that that's too much but if it was 30 percent more and we thought this is it's a bit like plastics isn't it mm -hmm. we've all changed about plastics mm -hmm. we need to do the same thing for food and we particularly we need to do it for chickens so for sustainable diets sustainable planet is the answer something along the lines of and i've always promoted eating the way our primal ancestors are, because I yep. firmly believe that evolution takes a long time. And I absolutely believe we have to look a bit more back to hunter-gatherer and we need to look at yep. the fruit, the vegetables, the animals we used to eat, because that's what I believe our body is designed for. I believe uh, you have to look seasonal, you have to yep. eat certain things in the winter, certain things in the summer. I believe you have to eat local. So, But we all, you know, lots of us went off and, and ate cheap, cheap meats for such a long time because we just did because it was available. Is the answer somewhere along the lines of, and to make it affordable and sustain the planet, you don't have to give up meat, whether that be lamb, chicken, uh, of course we just thought a little bit different about pork, but, but overall you don't have to give it up, but try and go, or we must all go, organic, have less of it, but we need some meat, and not only for health, but actually the planet kind of needs it to get back to the fact that farming needs it so we don't have to have so many pesticides, herbicides, and so on and so forth. So we have, we have more nutritional vegetables because meat's available, but we just eat, I think what I'm trying to say is let's all eat real meat, but because it's expensive, let's eat less of it. Be very careful about what, what we're eating, but if we're eating less of it, it means that the vegetables are more nutritious as well, everybody benefits. Um, so eat more, uh, only eat real meat that has a benefit to the environment, but cut it down so that, that, that it becomes affordable. Yes, 
what if everybody applied those principles to their future buying, this would be wonderful because it would enable um, a real rapid growth of sustainable farming. And it's important when you buy those sustainable meats to know that you're actually contributing to the solution. It's not just that you're allowed to do that. We need to do that because otherwise, let's think of all the farmers in the east of England at the moment who have probably been growing grains for 50 or 60 years. They see their soils are dead, they've got no life and the crop yields are plateauing mm -hmm. and maybe even declining. They know that if they reintroduced a mixed farming system with this crop rotation I described earlier with the clover and grass in it, uh, this would restore the fertility of their soils. But they're looking at the market for grass-fed lamb and beef because it's just as bad for grass-fed lamb more or less as it is for you know the other kind at the moment. They're thinking, well, why would I introduce a crop rotation which would bring in lamb and beef and maybe a dairy product when, when those markets, no, I mean, you're not <laughs> yeah. going to do that, are yeah, you? Absolutely. So we need to be sensitive to this situation and we need to align our future buying loyalty to the products which those sustainable farmers would produce if they adopted truly sustainable farming systems. We need to do that because we are probably 10 years away from irreversible climate change. Mm -hmm. And the biggest single influence on avoiding that is changing the way we farm. And farmers can't change the way they farm without having a correspondingly loyal consumer support yes. in the marketplace. Yes. The market can drive change here. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's powerful. Yep. And in fact, even politicians won't act unless they see the market. The market's mm -hmm. always ahead of policy makers because mm -hmm. politicians just want to get re-elected. Exactly. Well, if you go into that. Well, well, no, I, I totally agree. Uh, and uh, I, I totally agree that uh, the reality is it has to be consumer-led, but you, you know, it takes one person to change a revolution. And I think you're that person because I think you've just explained in really good plain English, the reality. You know, this thing that we, we saw on the BBC headline news, just stop eating meat because it's bad for the planet, which stems as far as I can see from the Eat Lancet report, that which when you look behind that, there were 30, you've got the numbers here, 37 people uh, that were on that panel, scientists and, uh, and so on. Uh, and yet uh, over 80% of them had conflicts of interests. Not only that, but not one of them was a practical farmer. Right. And I think, you know, <laughs> there's all these people telling us what to eat without knowing about agriculture. Yeah. How strange is that? And, you know, and bless his heart, is, even David Attenborough, yeah. who I, is a, you know, he's a national treasure, international treasure. Mm -hmm. He said on some program recently, I'm trying to cut down on red meat. I wanted to shout at the television and said, no, please differentiate between the red meat, which is part of the problem, yeah. and which actually you should be eating to support these hard-pressed livestock farmers and the arable farmers who want to farm in a more sustainable way. Mm -hmm. We can do this. And uh, David Attenborough would be a, a I mean, I, I met David Attenborough, mm -hmm. and I hope that I can um, influence his yeah. future diets, by, because I'm, he's a bright enough man. If yeah. he was given this information, mm -hmm. he would change his diet too, I'm convinced of it. Well, likewise, you know, Richard Branson uh, is a close friend of mine, and you know, he, very much well, push, 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 not eating meat. Uh, I was with him recently and uh, he gave me a burger and he went, what do you think of that, Steve? And I, I tasted it and I went, well, it's not meat. And he went, yeah, but it's almost like meat, isn't it? I went, but meat's not the problem, Richard. And uh, and actually, when you go and speak to chefs, what they put into it, it was one of the most unhealthy burgers you could possibly eat. And I think what you're teaching us, and I love this, I think the simple message at home is, if meat, whether that be beef, lamb, pork, or chicken. If it could be grown, or if it is grazed and, and it's grown uh, in proper sustainable ways, it's part of the solution, exactly. not the problem. Exactly. But in the modern way and where most of our meat uh, uh, and chicken comes from, because we're trying to make everything cheap, 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 that is part of the problem. So some meats, as long as they're done in a sustainable way, and basically, as long as your meat is primal, <laughs> then it's, just, it's part of the solution, not part of the problem. Exactly. And, you know, I've been putting these principles into practice on my farm for more than 40 years. So I can say that the system works, the system that we've been discussing. Yep. When it's applied in practice, yep. we, you can produce delicious, yep. health-promoting meat yep. in ways which can coexist with biodiversity, with butterflies, with bats, mm -hmm. with farmland birds, with all the wildflowers that used to coexist with all our grassland, mm -hmm. but because of nitrogen, fertilizer, and pesticides have largely disappeared. So this system could be applied at scale, and yep. it needs to be, but it can only be applied at scale 
if we, the yeah. consuming public, understand yeah. the issues. So how about this as advice to, to consumers across Great Britain? Everybody's got a, a, a food budget. You should have some meat in there because there's iron, there's B12, there's lots of vitamins and minerals that we can't get from a plant-based uh, diet. Uh, and, and, and more, uh, you know, the, 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 there's more fats than you'll ever get uh, from, uh, from a plant-based diet and healthy fats. Yep. So um, we should have some meats within uh, and poultry within our diet, but cut it down to where you can afford it. Stop buying the cheaper meats. It means you are probably gonna have to eat some more vegetables, more fruits, Cut down your meat so you still meet, you still get to your budget line, but by virtue then of ignoring and not eating those meats and poultry that are part of the problem, means they'll stop farming it. And once they stop farming it, exactly. we'll probably find that su sustainable and correct meat, organic and so on, will come down in price because that's what everybody will then be producing. There'll be more demand for that anyway then, and then we hopefully we just get back to where we were 100 years ago. Well, maybe forward because the situation mm. we're in now is different from how it was okay. 100 years ago. Yeah. And it's absolutely right, just to be clear about this, mm -hmm. we should be eating more vegetables, but mm -hmm. let's make sure that those vegetables are grown as part of a truly sustainable farming system near to where we live. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly possible. I know because I'm a vegetable producer, ex-vegetable producer myself, I've got the experience mm -hmm. that tells me that the best vegetables and fruits that you will ever eat will mm -hmm. be grown near to you in a sustainable farming system more nutritious, more delicious. So yeah. plant-based diets, yes, but complemented mm. with sustainable meat of the right kind. And we need to under, we need to all be experts in this stuff. And yep. why not? It's fascinating. Yep. Yep. And, and you know, you've got eight children, I've got seven children. It, it, we just have to get that education across. You know, in my little patch I've got at home, it tastes better. It doesn't look the same. No, <laughs> fact, it can look different. In, in fact, it looks very different yes, to what you've seen in the supermarket. It's actually more it, vital. Yeah, and you have to get your head around it because they're not perfectly straight, my, my beans. and yeah, there might be and, some knobbly carrots. Yeah, and the car carrots come out, mine don't even all come out orange, some come out green, but it tastes fantastic. And uh, you, we have to get used to growing some of our own vegetables, buying local where we can, start to understand food and just get that balance right. But the key thing is that I, I think the message I tried to get across in this hour was trying to unravel that, that whole headline that meat is bad for us. Yes, meat can be bad for us, it can be bad for the planet, but it's based on where that cattle, where that herd, where those lambs... What it ate, what how it, it ate, farmed, it and we need to understand yes. the difference. Yes. That's the point, to differentiate yep. between the livestock products, yep. which are part of the problem, yep. and yep. those which are part of the solution. So, and supermarkets and retailers and food uh, manufacturers take note yep. because there's market opportunities here because we are successful in getting these messages out to millions yes. of people yes. who are thinking what should I eat to be yes. sustainable and healthy that will translate into market trends supermarkets who offer us those yes. products when we go down to our local supermarket will gain mm -hmm. and those that don't won't that's what we want uh, and, and, and look it, you know David Attenborough I guess he's not eating meat because, or is anti-meat because of the environmental issues. And yeah. I think the message that you would give, I think, to David Attenborough, the same as I would give to Richard Branson, is meat can be part of the problem or the solution. It's just down to how that animal roamed, where it grew, what it ate, uh, because uh, it can be part of the solution or the problem. Exactly that. Exactly that. Look, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. We're going to do another show on the podcast and on TV. Really just think, looking at food, farming and health. This one, I've really tried to focus the, uh, around meats and poultry. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for really shining some light on the reality between the planet, our diet and what is sustainable and what isn't. Patrick, thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. No problem. If you enjoyed this podcast, then why not subscribe to the full series so you can hear from all the incredible health professionals we spoke to. For the full story, you can also get the book Fat and Furious, written by Steve Bennett, available on Amazon. And to say a huge thank you for watching us here on YouTube, we are even offering you an exclusive Amazon discount code so you can get yourself a copy. For more details, head to the description below.